Welcome everyone. My name is Stephanie Alban. I'm executive director of FIOPAIR Alliance. Thank you for joining us today. I'm here with Dr. Electron Kebabu, who I will introduce here momentarily. Uh, but first, I'd like to let you know that this program is brought to you by FIOPAIR Alliance. Our mission is to educate, empower, inspire. Um, patients and caregivers, as well as healthcare providers, and facilitate research uh, to, for better clinical treatment. So with that, I'd also like to thank Progenix for making this educational webinar series possible. Um, we have a video library of, this will be our 20th education webinar. So Progenix has been our partner throughout. So thank you to them. Um, couple of events we have coming up that I'd like to mention, if that's okay. We have a uh, management of skull-based para-educational webinar on May 17th with our expert, Dr. Neil Patel from Huntsman Cancer Institute. I'm really proud to start being able to take a little deeper dive into some of these topics. So that will be on May 17th. May 9th through May 2nd, we also have our third annual virtual fit. This is a fundraiser to raise awareness and funds for the mission of Theo Para Alliance. It's a great opportunity to connect with other Theo Para patients, to develop camaraderie, to connect with your family and let them know your story, and of course, to have fun. I did it last year. We actually had a blast. We use this really great platform that tracks your steps as well as your um, fundraising, and you can any activity, walk, bike, row, pickleball, whatever floats your boat um, in order to raise funds and awareness, and it's all virtual. Um, we also have our Awareness Week coming up at the end of August, which will be our third annual. And this year, we are holding our patient conference, which will also be virtual, and it'll be during Awareness Week, and it will focus on wellness. So more information to come on those events. Finally, I'd like to mention our Portland Regional Conference. We've just found all the details. That will be a half-day patient education program in downtown Portland. The details of that are on our website as well. Special thanks to Dr. Eric Mitra from OHSU for helping us put that program together. So would love to see um, those of you who live in the area on Sunday, June 26th in Portland. And the information for all of those events is on our website. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's get down to our agenda. Dr. Kebabu will share his screen in just a moment here. He's going to present for about 30 minutes. Then we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers from the community. Some of them have been submitted beforehand. You can also submit questions in the chat function, which we will ask live to Dr. Kebabu. Try to make your questions as uh, least specific as possible, which we were just talking is a little difficult when you're talking about surgery, but some of the questions are similar. So listen carefully for your question, which may be similar to somebody else's. Uh, our disclaimer, this is for educational purposes only and should not substitute the advice of an experienced field paramedical team um, that have in-depth knowledge of your personal situation. Thank you very much for that kind uh, introduction, Stephanie, and really congratulations. Uh, unbelievable and great work that the FIOPARA Alliance is doing, uh, and many of my patients have definitely shared, uh, benefited from it. I am pulling up my uh, PowerPoint, and I hope everybody could see it. I'm going to be talking about today about precision surgery for pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. And I really think uh, we're at the time uh, where we're able to provide our patients the best surgical intervention uh, based on their individual characteristic of that patient's uh, tumor. Uh, and this is in large part due to advances in imaging studies or um, imaging modalities, and then understanding the genetics of the disease. You will see on my slides, I'll refer to pheochromocytoma, abbreviated as PCC, or paragangliomas, or PGL. Uh, so that's what, in subsequent slides, if you see that, that's what I'm referring to. Uh, I do not have any conflicts of interest. And as Stephanie said, much of what I'm covering with you is general rubric in managing patients in our 
a state of the art way and your individual situation may very well be different. And also please keep in mind when I answer your questions, it is just based on my experience. It's not what Stanford Medicine does or it's necessarily what should be the case in your situation as I would not be familiar with the detailed medical records, imaging and uh, disease uh, process that you might have. And much of my comments or answers really are kind of a general philosophy or approach. So what do I mean by precision surgery? I think many of you might hear in the lay media, precision medicine, and it's really an initiative and us understanding that we need to provide individualized care to the specific patient. In this case, the patient with a tumor, pheochromocytoma, paraganglioma, and that not all patients are gonna have the same course. Well, I happen to believe that pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma currently is the prototypical tumor that we could truly provide precision medicine or precision surgical intervention. And that's largely to the advances in genetics and imaging studies. So what do I mean by that precision surgery? The advanced imaging studies tell us, is it just that one tumor that's present? Are there other multiple tumors that need to be considered? So lead to really refined staging of the tumor. And then the genetics of the tumor. For example, a VHL gene is a susceptibility gene for pheochromocytoma. And there's specific genotype, where the mutation in the gene is, and phenotype, how the tumor is gonna behave, information that's extremely important for us to have. So we could be exact and accurate in our surgical management of patients with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, or if you will, let the crime fit the punishment because surgical intervention is a significant intervention with risks in patients with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, and one needs to make sure that risk is justified. There are three areas I'm gonna cover in the next half an hour that I'll be with you. And it's just to summarize the genetics of the disease and who should get genetic testing and when, and then the specific imaging studies that any patient with a pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma should have, and how we use that information to provide personalized surgical management. Many of you know pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma are fairly rare, two to eight cases per million, at least in the US. They might be rare, but they result in significant morbidity and in some cases, mortality in patients that have pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. And the tumors could be functional. Many of those patients will clinically present with significant symptoms, but in some cases, it might be a non-functioning tumor that's causing a mass effect or it could be malignant, that is cancerous. And in pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, the way we make a cancer diagnosis is if it's spread to sites where there's no chromaffin cells, where pheochromocytoma and paragangliomas form, or if the tumor is locally invasive. Uh, it just this is to really emphasize how much of an advance there has been in the management of pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, it's almost a century ago that the first adrenalectomy was done by Dr. Rue and the Mayo brothers. And in that time, next slide, um, the mortality rate has dropped from 50% to really less than two to 3%. And that's because patients we know need alpha blockade as well as better intraoperative hemodynamic monitoring have resulted really in a very low risk of complications and death from surgical intervention. Next slide. And then in the 90s, the idea of using a minimally invasive surgery and better localizing imaging studies really led to patients having really faster recovery, less pain, uh, and even lower complication rates. Next slide. And then because of the natural history, it, we then understood that we could perform partial adrenalectomy and even robotic adrenalectomy and different surgical approach, posterior retroperitoneal adrenalectomy, all again leading to much faster recovery and better outcome for patients. So in the last two decades, next slide, 
we have also really understood the genetics of these tumors and even improved localizing studies. So unequivocally, the diagnosis of functional tumors could be reliably diagnosed by testing for plasma or blood and urine fractionated norminephrine and metanephrine. And typically if it's three times above the upper limit of normal, that's definitive that the tumor is functional. But keep in mind, some patients have a genetic predisposition and that slightly elevated level still could indicate a small tumor and imaging is very important in that next slide. So <clears throat> in addition to that, it's really important to emphasize a truly silent uh, tumor that is non-functional is rare. It's usually a head and neck paraganglioma and some refer to this as pseudosilent where it's a small tumor, or it's episodically functioning. So any patient that I operate on with a pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma, even if the norminephrine and metanephrine levels are not elevated, I always use alpha blockade. Next slide. And then rarely, I think it's important for us to recognize some of the biochemical testing gives us a clue of whether the tumor is gonna be in the adrenal gland or outside of the adrenal gland. Next slide, please. And then it's important that, and you can advance one more, that you have testing for dopamine because sometimes the paragangliomas, especially the head and neck and extra adrenal uh, paragangliomas could be secreting excess dopamine. And this could lead to asymptical, atypical, I should say, symptoms of abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and not hypertension, but hypotension due to the excess dopamine level and patients having weight loss. So this comprehensive biochemical testing then is really super important for you to get the optimal surgical intervention. Next slide. So what have we learned about the genetic testing? I won't talk about too much basic science, but just to emphasize, this is the Cancer Genome Atlas study on pheochromocytoma and paragangliomas. The important take home is that there's four categories or molecular pathway alterations these tumors could have, which I think will have in the future and the impact of the treatment or the selection of treatments that patients would be uh, able to have or personalized. Next slide. But we still have a gap in knowledge. Here is 27% of the tumors didn't have a, a germline mutation or a somatic mutation in a pheochromocytoma or pan, uh, paraganglioma causing tumor. So we still in about one in four patients don't have an understanding of what the cause of the tumor is. And in the surgical management of these patients, this is an also an important consideration. Next slide, please. So what are these 14 plus susceptibility genes? I'm not gonna go through all of the genes. I don't think that'll be useful for you. I'm just gonna highlight to you what are the important gene mutations in the clinical management of patients with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. Nearly half of patients that have genetic testing will have a mutation in the SDHX, succinate dehydrogenase X. There's five susceptibility genes there. I have highlighted in the red box and the most commonly mutated are SDHB and SDHC. And it's really important to note that, again, not a 10% rule tumor, that when it's an adolescent or a pediatric patient, 80% of the time, they'll actually have a germline mutation in the susceptibility gene. And in one in four patients that we see, they don't have a family history. They're the first family member to be diagnosed with an inherited predisposition. Next slide. So why is this information important? I'm just gonna share two cases with you of patients I took care of. One was a 45 year old man, had a left pheochromocytoma, the arrow pointing to the tumor, fairly large. Centrally, you could see it's necrotic, it's the darker spots. This patient was referred to me, had gotten two weeks of alpha blockade with phenoxybenzamine. <clears throat> so what do I do with this patient? Do I just take him to the operating room and do an operation? Next slide, please. The second case is a 32-year-old woman with a right pheochromocytoma. The arrow points to it on the MRI, it lights up on T2 image. She'd been blocked for three days and was referred to me. So do I just remove the right adrenal gland? 
and not do any further testing or workup. Next slide, please. This slide is just to emphasize that not every patient is going to have the cardinal feature of inherited syndrome, and it's not always present. That's why it's super important that we provide genetic testing, that not every patient is going to have an early age of onset of a pheochromocytoma or multiple tumors, bilateral tumors, or other tumors, such as in VHL, patients are at risk of kidney cancer and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, or are going to present with malignant disease. Next slide, please. So the question becomes then, is preoperative genetic testing imperative for optimal surgical management of pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma? I have a picture of former colleagues or fellows that worked with us and did the work, uh, and we looked at this question. Obviously, the patients had several indications for undergoing surgery. They had a functional tumor, or they were symptomatic with a mass effect, or the tumor was potentially malignant or metastatic, I should say, or, or had the risk of developing metastatic disease. And when you look at this cohort of patients, over 200 patients, tumor size was an important factor of whether the cancer came back, recurrent disease, or spread during follow-up after removal of their primary or metastatic tumor. As you could see, tumors less than three centimeters, there was near nil chance of the tumor coming back or recurrent disease. Those with tumors larger than six centimeters had a very high risk, 50% at almost 10 years follow-up. Next slide, please. Then we looked at, this is a cohort of patients, all had genetic testing. What was the driver mutation status and what was the risk of recurrent disease. Here you see patients with SDHB mutation had a much higher risk of developing metastatic and recurrent disease. So I think the answer to the question is yes, it's important because we need to select the appropriate operation if a patient has a high risk that their tumor is cancerous. That is to do a cancer operation. Next slide, please. The next question is, well, how does this impact in the specific operation? So there are some inherited syndromes that have a very low risk of metastatic or cancerous pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. And one of these syndromes is MEN2 due to a germline red proto-oncogene mutation. And this is a nice study that highlights the impact of doing adrenal sparing or cortical sparing adrenalectomy in these patients. Nearly 21% of these patients had subtotal adrenalectomy with a germline in the red proto-oncogene. And you could see the whole question becomes, what's the risk that they're going to get recurrent disease in the remaining adrenal gland or develop metastatic disease? None of the patients developed metastatic disease. 3% developed recurrent disease in the remaining adrenal gland 6 to 13 years after surgery. So, this highlights that it's very reasonable to do adrenal sparing surgery in patients with MEN2 and that their risk of recurrent or metastatic disease is low enough. What is the reason to do partial adrenalectomy? These patients are at risk of developing pheochromocytoma on the opposite side and needing steroid replacement or developing adrenal insufficiency crisis. Next slide, please. The other syndrome is VHL. Similarly, these patients are at risk for bilateral pheochromocytoma. This is a nice study that Rachel Offworth did in our cohort of VHL-associated pheochromocytoma. And as you could see, three out of four patients had initial presentation with unilateral, that's one side pheochromocytoma, but about one in four patients, though, had bilateral pheochromocytoma. And when you look at this cohort of patients, nearly 20% of patients during follow-up, developed a second primary on the opposite side. Next slide, please. So again, these patients are at risk for requiring steroid replacement or having adesonin or adrenal insufficiency crisis. And the data showed that only 14% of patients that had a partial adrenalectomy developed recurrent disease. None of the patients developed metastatic disease. So this buys patient's time not requiring steroid replacement or developing adrenal insufficiency crisis. And it is reasonable to do a partial adrenalectomy in VHL, RET, or patients with NF1 mutation because the risk of metastatic disease is low and it's technically feasible for smaller tumors. Next. So the genetic testing 
uh, is really important in the surgical approach. And if you click on the videos, I don't know if it will work or if we'll have time, it's not always also necessary to save the main adrenal vein. Uh, the slide, the video on top demonstrates a left adre partial adrenalectomy in a patient with VHL, where we end up clipping the adrenal vein, and this patient had adequate cortical reserve. This was the last remnant gland. And similarly, the video on your left lower panel is a right adrenalectomy. This patient had genetic testing and had an SDHB mutation, and the tumor was placed in the entire gland. So we did a total adrenalectomy. Again, the genetic testing information dictating the treatment of the patient. So to go back to the cases I shared with you, I ordered genetic testing in this first patient, and the patient was SDHB positive, had a large tumor, high risk of it being cancerous or metastatic, and we performed an open adrenalectomy with a lymph node dissection. The next slide, please. And then for the case two, that patient actually ended up having a family history for VHL. The genetic testing came back for VHL and further questioning. So we did a partial right adrenalectomy for that patient to reserve as much normal adrenal cortical tissue as possible so that the patient would not need steroid replacement. Next slide, please. The other area of advance is in localizing studies. There's so many localizing studies, and the real reason to do it is you want to make sure a patient doesn't have additional multiple sites of tumor that should be addressed at the initial operation. And the second reason you want to do it is if it's a cancerous tumor, to appropriately stage the patient and make sure surgical intervention is warranted. Next slide, please. Well, there's been tremendous advances. We know cell surface targets for radioisotope that we could use. So which imaging study should you have done? Next slide, please. I think unequivocally anatomic imaging with CT or MRI is important for the relationship of the tumor, but the resolution of it from head to toe might miss additional sites of disease. So functional imaging becomes important. Here I have head-to-head -head comparison of FDG PET, Dota Tate scan, DOPA, and dopamine. And as you can see, the image with the arrow shows additional disease that the other PET tracers don't show. Next slide, please. This is also PET scans of the head and neck. And you could see a patient with a right carotid body tumor and the lower panel left carotid body tumor. You see additional sites of disease on the dotatate and the FDG PET that you do not appreciate, certainly on the MRI that you see there and the other functional imaging studies. So it's important to do at least an FDG PET or a dotatate scan to detect additional disease. Next slide, please. This is a case that illustrates the case in point. 16-year-old young woman I had seen initially referred for a left pelvic paraganglioma that was functional. You see only tumor on the left side with the red arrow. You don't see anything on the other side. Next slide, please. Well, she had an FDG PET before an operation. We recognize she had disease on the opposite side that needed to be resected at the time of her initial operation and an adrenal satellite site of tumor right next to the larger tumor that was only detected on CT scan, but the FDG PET detected additional disease. Next slide. Another case in point, a patient that was referred for recurrent disease with a history of left paraganglioma, germline SDHB mutation, and then you could see on the functional imaging that I would not benefit the patient of removing the recurrent disease in the abdomen because the dotatate and FDG PET show additional sites of tumor in the bone and in the abdomen. Next slide, please. So in addition to the CT scan or MRI, functional imaging is really important, either with FDG PET if your institution doesn't have dotatate. Next slide, please. In the next set of slides, I'll just share with you a cohort of patients we took care of where they had prospective genetic testing, prospective functional imaging, and it really altered the management of these patients. Next slide, please.
So we did routine genetic testing and functional imaging in these patients. And this is work done by Dr. Pavel Nokel and asked, does preoperative functional imaging and genetic testing impact our surgical intervention? So in 22 a a percent of the cases, we detected additional sites of disease that needed to be addressed based on functional imaging, FDG PET imaging. Next slide. And how about for genetic testing? Well, 14% of the patients didn't have a family history and based on the genetic information that altered our surgical intervention. The other area that's difficult to decide who's going to benefit from surgery is in patients that develop metastatic or recurrent pheochromocytoma. And this is a study done by <clears throat> Ryan Ellis and Adavul Patel uh, when they were training with us. And as you could see in patients even with recurrent metastatic disease, who ends up having post-operative biochemical remission, that is no symptoms and no hypertension is driven by the germline mutation, specifically in the cohort here that are positive for SDHB benefited less. So I'm less inclined to offer an operation in a patient with metastatic disease, recurrent disease, with a germline SDHB mutation because surgical intervention is not likely to be durable. Next slide, please. And they meticulously looked at patient symptoms, okay? and whether what type of resection is. If we were able to do a complete resection, R0, or were there positive margins, grossly R2 resection, and then microscopic R1. And as you could see, when we compared patients that had R0 or R1 resection versus those that had gross positive margin, the patients that benefited when they had resection for metastatic recurrent disease, irrespective of their germline mutation status was whether we we're able to do a complete resection. Next slide, please. How can we use this information to predict who's going to do well or not? I shared with you, recommend getting FDHP, FDHG PET scanning, and this information could actually be helpful for predicting who's going to have progressive disease. Again, in deciding who could potentially benefit from an operation versus who is not going to benefit from an operation because the tumor is rapidly growing. And what they did was look at the amount of sugar uptake in the tumor, so the SUV max, and they calculated the tumor volume as well as the total lesion glycolysis, the amount of hypoxia in the tumor. And next slide, please. And based on a cutoff value you could see in the survival curves. There are patients that significantly benefit if their total lesion glycolysis or SUV max aggregate tumor volume was low with a surgical intervention. So another way of refining who's going to benefit from an operation. Next slide, please. And when you look at this from a symptom standpoint, as well as requiring antihypertensive, this also predicted who is going to have biochemical response and who is not going to require alpha blockade or not have hypertension. Next slide, please. The other area that's important just for abdominal and chest uh, uh, paragangliomas is head and neck paragangliomas. We specifically looked at patients with carotid body par paraganglioma who underwent genetic testing. This was 36 patients that had 43 primary resections on average median age of 33 years. And as you could see, those that had a germline SDHB mutation, again, had a shorter disease-free interval. And what's interesting is their resection was performed when the tumor was smaller. Next slide, please. So based on the genetic testing results for carotid body tumors, the algorithm that I use to manage patients, next slide please, is if the tumor, if the patient has an SDHB mutation, regardless of the tumor size of the carotid body tumor, I resect it because the risk of disease-free interval is much shorter. That is, they develop recurrent disease or metastatic disease. And if they don't have an SDHB mutation, I wait until it's greater than two centimeters because the risk of metastatic uh, disease or malignant disease is low. And what's interesting is, as you'd expect, if the tumor was larger, 
the complication was higher. So using the genetic testing information, you could intervene when the tumor was much smaller because the risk of metastatic or a cancerous tumor was higher. So the other area, and I think some of you have probably dealt with, is having operations or the tumor cannot be localized because if it's a second or third operation. And one area that functional imaging could be helped and this is a study we specifically did with 68 gallium dotatate that Dr. Mustafa Lakis uh, spearheaded. Since we were seeing a lot of patients that we see tumor on the PET scan, but it was a reoperation and it could make it difficult to localize it, is using gamma uh, radio guided surgery and injecting dotatate isotope of the operation at the time of the operation. And this is all patients with neuroendocrine tumors, but also included patients with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. And the important thing is, this is an option uh, for many patients that not to miss disease, disease that cannot be palpated or visually localized or seen on ultrasound. This is primarily for abdominal neuroendocrine tumors. 13% of the time, the gamma probe was helpful to detect it so that there was no disease missed at the time of the operation. So next slide, please. I'm going to finish up, but just summarizing key point. I think understanding the genetic basis of pheochromocytoma paraganglioma has tremendously improved the management of patients. And nearly half of patients will have a germline mutation. And I feel strongly that patients should have preoperative genetic testing because I think it affects the type of operation and intervention that I would do to give the patient the best chance of biochemical cure and that there's genotype phenotype associations that really dictate the natural history of the tumor and that patients should have functional imaging studies before they have an operation and in some case an operation is not indicated. All of these factors allow us to really provide precise care uh, for patients with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. Next slide, please. Thank you for sharing uh, precision surgery with you, and I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you so much for, we made it through that. I was a little concerned about the Wi-Fi, but we got through most of the slides. And Dr. Kimabu has been kind enough to share his slides. So when we upload uh, the recording of the webinar, we'll be sure to share those slides so you can revisit those at your convenience. Um, so at this point, I'd like to open it up to the Q&A portion. And we got some really great questions ahead of time. And that presentation was chock full of really important specific information regarding um, a precision surgery. So we'll probably revisit some of that information with the questions that are being asked. And I think that's really important because there was so much information um, to just kind of make sure that everybody understands. And I think this reinforces the two things that we say regularly, which is find an experienced field paramedical team and testing. So both of these things are critically important, and Dr. Kebabu's presentation, I think, reinforced both of those items. Um, so I'm just going to kind of jump into some of these questions here, and I'm going to start out with the softball for you. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about uh, biopsy? We got a question about, you know, I've heard biopsy is not recommended if pheopera is suspected. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no, that's a terrific and important question. Um, you know, most of the time when a patient presents with a tumor, you want to do a biopsy to characterize a tumor. You do not want to do that if you have a pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma or potentially. And the reason is it could result in a hypertensive crisis. So most medical centers will have uh, there's an imaging reading and the radiologist will say, oh, consider biopsy. Uh, and we know now that biopsy should not be performed because it could result in a hypertensive crisis at the time of the biopsy, even if the tumor is not functional. So there's really no added, the second aspect is no added benefit to the patient with biochemical testing. And even if it's a non-functional tumor, uh, the location of the tumor and testing for chromogranin A, for example, a non-specific neuroendocrine tumor marker, 
there is reasonably good accuracy that one knows or the provider knows that they're dealing with a pheochromocytoma or a paraganglioma. So the consequences of the biopsies are so grave, and that's why we recommend no biopsy. Great. Um, and this is actually a kind of a follow-up question that's kind of related to um, this. We have a patient who reached out um, directly to me, and I, I offered to ask him a question um, to you. So he uh, was diagnosed with a five-centimeter unspecified mass that showed up on a PSMA PET scan. Um, so mm. an incidental finding. Um, subsequently, had a biopsy, obviously, a suspected paraganglioma, but um, mm -hmm. the result was that it was diagnosed as para. So his questions are, um, one, you know, he wants to find the best medical team, and I, we gave him a, a couple recommendations and also told him to tune into this webinar. But would would the next steps for him, even though he's already been, and I'm not sure how it if it was pathology, but to do the, the 24 hour urine and the blood plasma tests and genetic testing, functional imaging, what do you recommend for next steps? Yeah, thank you for that question. So the next steps should be biochemical testing. You want to accurately assess whether it's a functional tumor, okay? And the genetic testing is also important because that'll affect again the natural history potentially predict the natural history of this tumor but also what type of intervention should be considered and then accurately staging you know the majority of patients with pheochromocytoma paraganglioma have benign tumors but they're also at risk of other multiple primary sites of paragangliomas but if it's inherited syndrome also other tumors or cancers in other organs so that's why it's important to do the function, in addition to the anatomic imaging, the functional imaging. Based on that, then you have a complete picture. What is the most appropriate treatment algorithm? Is it surgical intervention? What type of surgical intervention? Is the tumor at other sites? Or is there another primary cancer that we need to consider? in the context of this newly diagnosed five centimeter paraganglioma. And, and I believe this workup should be done expeditiously. And I think that's why the Fiopera Alliance is such a great resource in providing you sites that you could have this multidisciplinary evaluation and then discussion in a tumor board of what are the next best steps. Great, thank you. Um, and then we have some questions. Uh, Linda on the attendee end is collecting questions from our patients live. So question regarding alpha blockers, do you have a preference for alpha blockers? Um, I, I think it's, I don't, uh, I have a preference from a standpoint that what do we have the most longest data for is phenoxybenzamine. Um, but it is difficult and it's also very expensive uh, um, for some patients to be able to get it. So doxyzosin is a reasonable. I think what you really need is alpha blockade. And here, our anesthesiologist, Dr. Fredman, is very involved. So what we do is see patients in a multidisciplinary group, start the alpha blockade, and he monitors that. And in some instances, it'll be phenoxybenzene, or in some instances, It'll be Dr. Zosin. I, I think the most important thing is that the patient gets the alpha blockade. Um, but we have the greatest data for phenoxybenzamine, but that doesn't mean the other alpha blockades are not safe and useful. And then the other question I see, I think, is in the chat. Um, and it's a question of tumor was found on adrenal gland, and tests show it is not secreting but patient is still experiencing debilitating symptoms and other tests. Um, so in general, this is the pseudosilent uh, part of my presentation I was talking about. Uh, you know, the tumor could have episodic function. So it's really important to get repeat testing at the time, especially when the patient is having symptoms. And certainly we found patients that quote unquote, had negative biochemical testing, 
that when we're doing it at the time the patient is having symptom, it's positive. And this is another area where the functional imaging could help. If it's an adrenal tumor, we could distinguish based on the Dota tape being positive or even MIBG that it's actually a pheochromocytoma and not an adrenal cortical tumor. So there's two ways to evaluate those patients. A, you wanna do your biochemical testing um, during a symptomatic episode. And then the second is the functional imaging could help you determine whether the tumor in the adrenal gland is a pheochromocytoma or a tumor from the cortex of the adrenal gland. And I appreciate you, I don't know if, if you what happened while I was gone there with the Wi-Fi again. Uh, but thank you for um, for just picking up the slack here. I'm going to have a long discussion with AT&T here. Um, okay, a question regarding carotid body, because we get a lot of questions regarding, regarding carotid body paragangliomas. Um, and I have a few here. Um, I'm going to ask one regarding, I have a carotid body para and my cranial nerves are wrapped around it. I ended up going through radiation uh, because my case was deemed inoperable. Is there any way to safely remove my tumor? Maybe you can just talk also in general about, you know, active observation of carotid body. Um, that would be great. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. You, you know, um, the carotid body tumors, not all of them are going to grow or spread or be cancerous. Um, and, and this is why I think a multidisciplinary evaluation and assessment of should it be removed, is it resectable, uh, is important, first of all. And, you know, I think, um, you know, this I can't answer it specific to your case without reviewing the images, but the genetic information is also important. You know, I, we've observed patients with large SDHD mutations where the morbidity, the complications from a, removing a carotid body tumor would be too high. And the reason is the natural history of the tumor. So having imaging done in the past and over time also helps you predict what the progression of the tumor is. Uh, there are other multimodal treatments as you've had radiation. In some cases, we've given patients cold somatostatin based on it being Dota tape positive, where it keeps it in check, so to speak. Uh, and then in some patients, we even considered PRRT, so if it's Dota tape positive. So there's multiple treatment options. It doesn't have to be surgery. And certainly, if the operation is going to result in significant complications or morbidity to the patient, that necessarily will not be uh, the best approach. But there are multiple options. Uh, and I think having the appropriate imaging, knowing the genetic background, one then could optimally manage each individual patient and in deciding no intervention, active surveillance, or the many different treatment options uh, based on their side effect or complication profile. All right. I think this brings us to the end of the webinar. Um, I'm happy to answer any additional questions, uh, either through Fiopera Alliance. Um, uh, and thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to join you here today. I apologize for the technical difficulty. Um, uh, and again, uh, happy to answer questions through Fiopera Alliance, or you could directly contact me as well. Uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, join you this morning. All right. You take care. Bye-bye.